Once upon a time, motor races were simple one-off events, with one having the biggest prize money, the Grand Prix of a particular country. From 1950, the FIA began designating some Grand Prix as championship events and awarding points, but in that inaugural year there were still 14 non-championship races to 8 in the championship, and as late as 1971 there were still 8 non-championship races in the calendar, 5 of them in the UK, to 11 point-scoring ones. But as the 70s wore on, the championship calendar expanded, and the formula became more technically complicated and expensive to enter, and one of the few things that FISA and FOCA agreed on was that there was no place for amateur hacks in the sport. Gradually, the number dropped, and if it weren't for the fisa FOCA spat resulting in the 1980 Spanish Grand Prix and the 1981 South African Grand Prix ending up as non-championship rounds, there wouldn't have been one since 1979. The race of champions at Brands Hatch had been first run in 1965, then annually from 1967 to 77, and then once more in 1979 as part of the short-lived Aurora AFX British Formula One Championship. It had traditionally acted as an opener for the European Formula One season and usually attracted a strong field. Previous winners include Jackie Ickes, Jackie Stewart, Emerson Fittipaldi, James Hunt and Gilles Villeneuve. With the British Grand Prix moving back to Silverstone for 1983, circuit owner John Webb decided to revive the race and see if there was still a market for it. Foker boss Bernie Eccleston agreed to encourage teams to participate, though he was personally dubious. Unfortunately, the timing was not great. The race would be held just a week before the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard, so, just like in the championship itself last year, teams would need to pack up and relocate from Kent to the south of France in just four days. Furthermore, a major tyre test for Pirelli and Michelin was taking place at Paul Ricard on the weekend of the Race of Champions, so teams attending that would have a distinct advantage over those spending the weekend at Brands instead. The net result of all of this was that Bernie with his Focoboss hat on agreed that teams would only be expected to send one car, and with his Brabham boss hat on he did just that. He sent the spare car, driven by Hector Ribaki, with both PK and Petrezzi in their main race cars off at the Paul Ricard tyre test. Others followed suit, and in the end there were 13 cars entered. Rosberg for Williams, Danny Sullivan for Tyrrell, the aforementioned Rebecca for Brabham, John Watson for McLaren, Nigel Mansell getting his first go with the Turbo Lotus Renault, Raul Boesel for Ligier, René Arnou for Ferrari, Chico Serra and Alan Jones in the Arrows, Guerrero and Brian Henton for Theodore, Jean-Louis Schlesser in the Sol Ram, preparatory to buying a drive in the second car, and Stefan Johansson debuting the new Spirit Honda, resplendent in a new red, white and blue colour scheme. Jean-Louis Schlesser was a nephew of Joe Schlesser, French Formula 1 driver and friend of Guy Ligier, after whom the Ligier's JS chassis are named. Jean-Louis was born in Nancy, but grew up in French Morocco, returning to metropolitan France for university and military service. He enrolled in the racing school at Le Mans, and began driving rally and sports cars during the 1970s, and then moving into single-seat races with F3 in 1976, alongside continued sports car racing. In 1978, he tied for the French F3 title with Alain Prost, and in 1981 won Le Mans at his first attempt. For 1982, he moved into Formula 2 with Maurer, and also undertook some testing duties for Williams. Getting a taste for Formula 1, he decided to get some sponsorship together to buy into the second seat at Ram, and hopefully raise some interest in a more permanent drive. So, the teams flew in from Long Beach with Danny Sullivan, arriving fairly last minute, then proceeding to have a blazing row with his girlfriend over the phone. He was rooming with Formula 3 driver Russell Wood, who took him out in London the night before the race for beer and curry to commiserate. Things got a bit messy, and the American driver would arrive at the circuit the following morning with a stonking hangover. Practice for the race saw Ferrari trying out new suspension, Lotus having difficulties with their tyres, Rebecca struggling to get the hang of the Brabham after a year out, Schlesser likewise on a steep learning curve in the Ram, Henton enjoying himself in the Theodore, and two Honda turbo engines exploding, despite thousands of miles of trouble-free testing before now. So Rosberg and Arnoux ended up on the front row, then Jones and Watson, Sullivan and Henton, Guerrero and Mansell, Boesel, Rebecca and Serra. Johansson qualified 12th, some 19.7 seconds off pole, and Jean-Louis Schlesser failed to set a time but was allowed to start 13th. A full programme of support racers saw a spectacular but thankfully non-harmful accident in Formula Ford when Eddie Cheever's younger brother Ross crashed out and left a wheel on the circuit, which Dutch driver Allard Kalf literally tripped over. Then it was time for the main event, a short 40-lap blast with two of the three advertised Formula One champions on the grid. 
The lights went green and away they went, Rosberg taking the lead from Arnoux with Watson third, but further back a hungover Danny Sullivan got nudged wide and, fighting the car to stay on the track, ended up going right round the outside and taking third. Jones was soon past Watson too. Arnoux got passed into the lead on lap one, while further back Johansson was moving up and was now eighth behind Mansell and Rybaki. Jones was pressuring Sullivan for third, but to no avail, while Arnoux and Rosberg continued running close together at the front. After just four laps, Johansson's Honda engine expired in a cloud of smoke, the third engine in two days to do so, leaving the Japanese firm with more work to do to get it ready for racing in anger. At least it had been fast, near the tops of the timing sheets in practice. Arnoux's tyres, meanwhile, had blistered in the frenetic race, and he and Rosberg were quickly caught by Sullivan and Jones, and the four cars were running right together. Rosberg eventually got through, and Sullivan followed further round the lap, just before Arnoux peeled in for new Goodyears. So it was Rosberg, Sullivan, Jones, with Henton fourth in the Theodore, and Mansell came in to retire with handling problems, and Watson a couple of laps later with a dodgy transmission. By now it was a quarter distance already, and Rosberg looked pretty comfortable in the lead, with Sullivan equally happy in second place, but as half-distance approached, Rosberg also started to suffer from tyre blistering. Sullivan closed right up, his own tyres having been scrubbed in in the warm-up, while Arnoux pulled in to retire with camshaft trouble. Rosberg's tyres were so badly blistered that it was visible to the naked eye and his car was twitching around on the circuit, but the Williams team kept him out, and Sullivan would have to make his own way past if he wanted the win. He was certainly going to give it a go, and over the last six laps he was all over the back of the Williams like a cheap suit. The combination of Rosberg's assertive driving and the extra oomph of the Judd-tuned Ford engine kept the reigning champion in the lead. Rosberg crossed the line half a second ahead of Sullivan to take his second Formula 1 win, with Jones finishing third, followed by Henton, Boesel, Schlesser and Guerrero. Alan Jones thus finished his two-race deal, with Arrows having done all he could to put himself forward for a return to F1, as had an impressive Brian Henton, while Jean-Louis Schlesser had acquitted himself reasonably well in his debut in the end. It had been a fun day out for all the family, and an exciting race for spectators and TV audiences alike, but nevertheless only a qualified success, and would, as it turned out, be the last non-championship Formula One race ever run.